It's a pleasure to have you all with us. Uh, without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll crack on. I thought I would start by telling you a little bit about me um, and how I've become into this position where I've, I've started to look at frequent callers in some detail and I thought I'd start off by finding the most embarrassing picture I could of myself um, and sticking it on here to share with everybody else as a bit of an icebreaker. Um, so I, originally I'm from the West Midlands, from Wolverhampton, um, where I decided to move up to the northwest to pursue my goal to become a paramedic and deliver pre-hospital care. Um, I was fortunate enough to pass the course and um, obtain employment with the Northwest Ambulance Service and it's through there where I started to develop uh, my interests within pre-hospital care. Um, an area of that is, is HEMS operations. Uh, I was a HEMS paramedic on the Northwest Air Ambulance for two years and I, I still undertake HEMS activities now. And I was also involved in the rollout of Pathfinder um, and other um, pre-hospital decision support making tools. Um, it was just after here where I got the opportunity to become a management consultant for a top, a top four consultancy within healthcare. Um, and it just seemed like a great opportunity to go out into the big wide world and find, find out a little bit more about the private sector and how the private sector interacts with the wider NHS. Um, the problem there was is that I miss Grin a little bit too much uh, and I'm uh, very passionate about pre-hospital care and whilst I got lots of great opportunities to work within the um, acute and primary care settings, um, the opportunity to come back into the pre-hospital environment was too, was too great for me to turn down really. And that's why now I'm undertaking the role as a DARSI Fellow for the London Ambulance Service, um, which is uh, on a year secondment basis uh, and it's aimed and it's focused at um, improving clinical leadership um, within host organisations. So what, what is a frequent caller um, DARSI Fellowship? Well, the DARSI programme is uh, was designed by the uh, Leadership Academy and it was aimed to improve clinical leadership within host organisations. Um, it's pretty much a 50-50 kind of programme where 50% of the time is aimed at um, to be spent in the classroom to look at clinical leadership theory and how we that can be applied within um, the National Health Service and within the private sector, um, with the other 50% of the time being able to have a tangible project to be able to apply these aspects of clinical leadership to. Um, the program um, thrives on system innovation and the implementation of change um, and successfully navigating this year's worth of course will give you a postgraduate certificate in leadership. Um, for me, my area of expertise will be looking at frequent callers uh, of ambulance services and specifically London Ambulance Service. Um, and that was to look how we currently manage them and how we can make things a little bit better. Um, at this point, it seems quite pertinent to, to discuss the presentation today is focused on our national approach to the management of frequent callers. Um, and a lot of the information gathered today has been collected from colleagues across the whole of the country um, that sit on something called the Frequent Caller Ambulance Network. Um, I'll discuss that in a little bit more detail later on. Um, but that's enough about me and of the program and, and why I'm here tonight. Why don't we go straight into, into the, the topic what we're all here to discuss, um, which is frequent callers. So the reason why I originally became interested in frequent callers was due to the number that we were visiting in a normal shift as an operational paramedic. And I was, I was left quite frustrated because I was always left with the impression that I wanted to do a little bit more. It felt to me that the coordination of care for these patients that, that inevitably were in, in some sort of need but couldn't always communicate exactly what they required from a health and social care um, setting it wasn't being fulfilled at that time uh, and that had basically manifested in, in um, the frequent calling of 999 uh, and I basically wanted to do a little bit more. Um, the first question that usually gets proposed um, is what is a frequent caller and I think the national management of, of frequent callers or high intensity users has certainly uh, picked up pace since we have a national definition. So the Frequent Caller Ambulance Network dis defines a frequent caller as any patient aged 18 or over who calls five or more times in a single month from a private dwelling or anybody aged 18 years or older uh, who calls more than 12 or more times over a three-month period from a private dwelling. 
And just to break this definition down into a little bit uh, of, a, of greater detail, first and foremost, the age range. That's really important due to um, the actions that, that we, we take as clinicians and as healthcare organizations in how best to, uh, what was most appropriate to manage these types of patients. Anybody under the age of 18 and would be subject to um, child safeguarding arrangements um, and would need immediate uh, assessment um, under those um, under, under those types of attributes following those very descriptive and prescriptive processes. Uh, for that very reason, we, we don't classify children within this frequent caller cohort. That's not to say that we don't identify them nationally um, and that we don't work very closely with colleagues within our respective safeguarding departments. However, for the national reporting uh, capabilities, we do look at only adults. The second part of the definition I'd like to bring your attention to is the frequency of calls. Uh, and as you can quite clearly see on the screen there, there's two frequencies that we're looking at. And really that's to help us as healthcare organizations to spot the trends that frequent callers are demonstrating to us in their behavior at that one time. So five or more times in one month from a private dwelling. Um, the, uh, the number of five or more times was um, distinguished on the bog standard patient that perhaps may have an exacerbation of a chest infection. Um, and uh, the general consensus provided nationally was that any patients that calls more than five times should be classified as somebody that perhaps isn't, isn't having all of their health needs met, um, which perhaps may require collaborative effort from the wider healthcare economy. And the five or, the five or more times in that, in that first month really aims to show the immediate acute crises um, that we really need to, to provide some additional support to. The second part of the definition, the 12 or more times over a three month period, is trying to identify um, patients that perhaps are suffering from chronic conditions um, that may be escalating quite slowly over time, which may be missed by perhaps our colleagues in emergency department settings or primary care settings um, because of the nature of the increase in, in, in prevalence of, of, of um, calls to 999 or to the GP surgery or to the acute provider. So what we're trying to do here is to safeguard anybody that has an acute um, crisis or, or has a, a more slowly but ever still developing chronic crisis. And that provides the, the, the national definition. So how many are there? Where, well, on average, uh, large ambulance services usually have a cohort of 2,000 patients which can be classified as frequent service users. Um, more often than not, the methodologies in which ambulance organizations have taken to deal with these patients are quite robust, um, which means that we do deal with an increased number of them um, on a hear and treat basis. Um, not wishing to teach anybody to suck eggs here, but um, each ambulance organization works with commissioners um, to provide three tariffs of care that we offer to our patients, that being hear and treat, where the patients are, are um, assessed and managed over the telephone without um, need for a face-to-face -face assessment, uh, a see and treat where a crew or an ambulance clinician will go out and assess and treat that patient without onward um, conveyance to, um, to an ED department or, or other referral pathway, and um, see and convey where we will go and then we will also convey to an acute uh, provider. Uh, just before we, we move any further, I can see that I've just got a question there. How does from a private dwelling in the definition apply to the homeless people and people in hostels, etc., please? Um, so just going back briefly, um, it actually doesn't alter the way that we manage um, homeless people. Um, the reason why the private dwelling was within the definition um, was to separate uh, areas of care which perhaps should be provided by the institution themselves. So the greatest example there could be the care home, for example. And the reason why the, 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 the free can group was very keen to differentiate care homes was because that was a different, that, that, that usually comes under a different project um, and um, the funding for that has some different implications as well. So we thought you would best differentiate the, the difference between care homes or residential homes or nursing homes and frequent callers which are calling from um, the private dwelling, so I hope that answers that question. 
So, so yeah, usually um, ambulance services are getting a little bit better at dealing with the majority of frequent callers over the telephone. Uh, and the reason for that is because we are becoming a little bit better at acting as the care coordinators remotely. Um, a, large, a large question that I, that I usually get asked is that what, why should the coordination of care for these patients fall under the remit of pre-hospital care? Why should we not push this back onto people like GPs or community nurses or, or, or other professionals such as, such as those? My response to those questions always is that we have an equal responsibility as healthcare professionals to deal uh, and to address the needs of our patients as, as we see fit. Uh, and I suppose if we don't, then, then, who else, then who else will at that time? Um, so I think we have an equal responsibility as well as our, our, as our colleagues and our partners within the uh, entire care pathway process in which to try to do something for these, for these patients who are at the crisis at this point. Um, what I would say is that I also think that we need to do more as a profession um, and certainly emergency, primary, secondary and charitable care also need to try to do a little bit more from their point of view as well because it's only through that collaborative practice where we'll make things better. However, being at risk of uh, peaking a little bit too early, I'll save that till later on in the presentation. A challenge that we have at the moment as ambulance services is the amount of frequent callers that we are unable to manage. And I think this touches on your question, Elizabeth, about the non-managed frequent callers. Because there is such a large number of patients um, and such a finite amount of resources within pre-hospital care organizations, um, who are, are, have to be focused on providing the business as usual? It's very difficult to manage the entire cohort of frequent callers. It's very difficult to create individual care plans for those perhaps 2,000 patients that have complex care needs. And so what we're finding is that a large proportion of frequent callers actually go unmanaged, and that's because a lot of the focus on frequent caller management is aimed at the most prolific or entrenched of frequent caller. And quite simply, the reason for that is because those frequent callers that present either the most times to switchboard or, or get an ambulance sent to them or have been doing it the longest have the greatest um, implications on, on our resources as pre-hospital care organizations. Uh, and that means they take a lot of time in which to um, address uh, and in which to create interventions with. Um, a, slide, a future slide that, that's coming up is going to look at how we currently deal with frequent callers and how we make them better. However, what we are finding is that sometimes the uh, complexity of some of these patients is so vast is that we're only, we're only dealing with the tip of the iceberg at the moment as far as, as pre-hospital care management of frequent callers go. However, what I would say is that things are, are on, on, the, on the increase and that's Due, due to some phenomenal input from national ambulance services that are demonstrating some pockets of absolutely excellent practice. And we are getting a lot better at sharing um, what works well. Uh, and really, I suppose that forms the basis of the chat tonight. Um, so thanks very much for that question, Elizabeth. Um, so how do we manage uh, frequent callers uh, nationally? And how do we know how well we're doing? Well, quite rightly so, the, the management of frequent callers is actually captured within the Ambulance Clinical Quality Indicator Package, which has been um, requested by government and from the Department of Health. Um, and I think that is in relation to the amount of resources um, which these patients can consume in their times of crisis. The part that I'd really like to bring to all your attention here um, is within sort of the midst of, of all of the boring spreadsheets in which clinical quality indicators can usually be found. Um, it's really important to have a look at the metrics which are being applied to our management of frequent callers. And I know that this is a hot topic within the, um, the pre-hospital care environment when we look at things like STEMI care or stroke care or certainly the eight minute response indicators. Um, but certainly for the management of frequent callers, it's really, it's really important that we go into it in some detail. So the way that we are assessed as ambulance services uh, within the UK is by looking at the number of ambulance calls which we get to our switchboards and then comparing that against the number of those calls which have been made by a patient classified as a frequent caller who have a locally agreed frequent caller procedure in place. Now, I'm going to break that down because it took me a, a few, a few um, read-throughs to actually get to the bottom of what we were actually being assessed upon. But in summary, it's the amount of frequent callers that have care plans which have called within that month 
um, as part of um, the collective number of calls that we get through to the switchboard. The part that I would certainly like to raise everybody's attention to is the locally agreed frequent caller procedure that's in place. And at the moment, um, the FreeCAN group are looking at implementing a national guideline for this. However, just for a little bit of clarity, I've tried to go into a little bit more detail at the two bullet points that you can see at the bottom of your screen. Um, FreeCAN have advised that frequent caller procedures should be locally determined and relate to individual patients, uh, which should be agreed with the individual and main care provider, for example, the GP and the mental health service. Now, first and foremost, when I when I looked at the, this method of, of uh, measuring quality, um, I found it a little bit difficult to understand why that the, the the procedure should be locally determined. However, when I have investigated into a little bit more detail, I can actually see the quality of um, of having a very local uh, a very locally specific way of managing frequent callers. What we found that, and again we'll go into some of the, uh, the detail and the evidence base in, in a couple of further slides, is what we found, the majority of frequent callers um, benefit from the demonstration of collaborative practice with other health and social care providers within the area. Uh, and we can only work with what we have in our respective areas and that is why the local approach is so important to us. I think what we will find going forward, uh, the same with all of the ambulance clinical quality indicators, is that there will be a more uh, prescriptive approach to the quality aspect of it. And so perhaps a little bit more prescriptive um, to, uh, endeavors to look at exactly what is it within the evidence base that reinforces the change of frequent caller behavior. How do we get them out of these crisis periods and how can we share that nationally? So things like um, assessing how we are working collaboratively, how many care plans are in place, how many multidisciplinary team meetings. I think I, I don't I don't foresee that being too far away. Um, but looking down the, the screen, we can see that the um, proportion of calls from patients for whom a locally agreed frequent caller procedure is in place usually hovers around the 1% to 1.5% mark. Um, and more often than not, speaking for my colleagues nationally, this is where we can say that there's a frequent caller care plan in place which links up the dots within health and social care settings to enable us to coordinate the care for the patient at any one time. I will be going through some um, case studies later on to be able to actually show this in action. However, if we know that there's a frequent caller that predominantly calls with anxiety, if we can provide the best quality of care for that patient by um, referring that patient to the crisis team who can then come out and, and, and conduct some immediate cognitive therapy, for example, that should be captured in a care plan and we, that should be shared with the wider um, stakeholders within health and social care so that if the patient presents to those two, um, that there is a standardized level of care which is coming out. Um, what I will go through in, in a few f f further slides are the different approaches which have been taken nationally because there is a there isn't certainly one um, national approach to the management of frequent callers. However, I just would like to bring to your attention um, who the top, top performers are at the moment in the management of frequent callers, and that's South Central Ambulance Service and Yorkshire Ambulance Service. Um, what we can usually say around here is that this is where that, that um, evidence-based practice has been implemented to the extent whereas they have been able to um, provide the evidence about the enhanced behavior and the clinical quality improvements towards the care of frequent callers in their regions. Um, and certainly that's something that I'm wishing to standardize um, throughout a wider area. Um, just noticed a question um, posted by Alan Davis. Um, sorry, Alan, I've just noticed that that was uh, pushed forward through at quarter two. I, I can talk a lot about this topic, so um, <coughs> excuse me. Thanks very much for that. Um, in regards to frequent callers, are these definitions covering frequent callers of those who perhaps could have seen out of hours GPs or self-care, um, perhaps patients that don't necessarily require an emergency ambulance? One of the challenges that I find, uh, Alan, is that um, the national definition which has been adopted by ambulance services hasn't been adopted by emergency departments or by primary care. However, what I have found is that when we work collaboratively to first and foremost share this definition and to work with these different stakeholders um, to work collaboratively in the management of frequent callers, more often than not, the patient sees that benefit. 
um, which leads me towards the theme, I suppose, of tonight's presentation, that, that benefits to patient care can only be generated through collaborative practice and working much more effectively as a, as a healthcare economy as opposed to individual clinicians or individual organizations. So um, I find it quite interesting that there are very few um, other national indicators for other care providers which look at frequent callers. I think we're relatively unique within the pre-hospital setting. But I also think that that shows how much of a priority this patient cohort are for us and how much we have an ability to be able to set the standard and to become the industry leaders within the management of these, of these specific types of patients. And which I think can only be beneficial towards the development of paramedic practice. Uh, I think I discussed earlier about the um, leadership um, aspects towards the management of these patients and I certainly think that this is a, a great way of being able to demonstrate our, our competency in navigating the wider health and social care economy. Um, I hope that covered the question but please feel free to, uh, to send me another one if, if you'd like to, any, any of those points clarified. So just in summary about the ACQIs, uh, more often than not it focuses on the implementation of care plans for those patients that are identified as frequent callers um, or certainly um, engaging the wider health and social care economy to, to manage those patients much more effectively. Um, and so for me I, I think that's great, um, it shows how, how well we are working collaboratively with the wider health and social care economy which I feel um, it is okay, but it certainly needs to improve. We can certainly get much better. So who are frequent callers? What makes somebody a specific frequent caller? Um, what we've certainly found nationally is that we can classify three frequent callers into three areas, and that, that's um, the most prolific of frequent, um, sometimes known as entrenched, but those, those points are very different, and I'll, and I'll touch upon that in a second. Um, those that are escalating or de-escalating and those which are at the base. Now, more often than not, those patients that are in the base can be categorized by um, the mismanagement of one of a contributory factor. So let's, for example, say that there's a chronic comorbidity which has become mismanaged. Let's say that that is um, COPD, for example. If a patient has COPD and has a chest infection on top of that, we would not find it uncommon for a patient to trip that five or more times in a single month of calling 999 perhaps to receive a nebulizer or to be conveyed into to, to ED if, if the difficulty in breathing was, was that severe um, and that would make them a frequent caller for that period of time. In contrast what we found with the most prolific of frequent callers is that they have a lot of the contributory factors which you can see to the right of the page uh, and which builds their complexity which also builds the reason why they're, they're a frequent caller in the first place that takes a great deal of organization um, to be navigated through the wider healthcare economy in a time of crisis, um, which we find very challenging and the patient finds very challenging. Um, and if we find that challenging, certainly as healthcare providers, of course, patients that perhaps can't communicate as well or um, perhaps are struggling to process things due to an exacerbation of a mental health issue, um, of course, they're gonna find things um, equally more difficult. The, the cohort of patients that we've got in the middle of that pyramid, the escalating or de-escalating, that's where we usually find in patients that have started off with a single contributory factor from the base, which we haven't managed to get on top of, <coughs> which are slowly escalating to become a prolific frequent caller, or in contrast, those that are prolific that we are managing to, to get a little bit of a grip uh, of, and we've started to de-escalate their behavior because we've, we've managed to, to manage a lot of the key contributory factors um, a lot more effectively. I mentioned earlier on this slide the difference between prolific and entrenched um, and that has been a key topic of discussion certainly within the FreeCAN group nationally. So the most prolific of frequent caller are those that call the most number of times within that monthly period. In contrast the entrenched frequent caller are those that have um, regular behavior um, every single month uh, which is very difficult to, to break the cycle of. So a great example there um, could be a patient who has mental health problems, perhaps personality disorder, um, who is also homeless that will call 20 times per month no matter what type of intervention has been tried previously. 
actual definition of prolific and um, entrenched is actually the topic of discussion at FreeCAN at the moment. And so what I would ask is if anybody's got any um, suggestions for that, and I know certainly I've got mine, um, send them through and I'll, and I'll be happy to present that back at the FreeCAN group, um, which is next to meet in, in, in the forthcoming weeks. However, what we're looking at is de a definitive figure so that we can um, put this patient into a category of care um, which enables them to receive the most uh, attention at that time. Which kind of is a, is a, is a good a good time to lead on to the next slide, actually. And I'm gonna I'm gonna do the um, the famous thing here of contradicting myself because what I'm going to do is is to argue the very reason why patients become frequent callers is because we try to categorise and silo. Uh, and provide care in silos in, in, in so much of everything that we do within healthcare. Um, a great example here um, is our management of strokes, trauma, or, or MIs in contrast to those that have the chronic comorbidities. But I'll touch upon that in, in a little bit more detail in, in, in the forthcoming slides. I've just mentioned, uh, looked at a question from Mark Higgins, um, who asks, in my experience, are the majority of these callers more patients with mental health or social issues? issues as opposed to patients with medical problems. Um, the majority of Mark's patients seem to want somebody to talk to, uh, which is a very interesting observation. So I think what the evidence base tells us at the moment, which actually takes me on to a great seamless link, uh, thank you very much Mark, onto my next slide, is that it's not uh, one certain type of thing, but certainly we know that mental health problems and so social isolation has a great deal um, to play in the care of the uh, of these patients, um, what we find those as key enablers or catalysts, uh, so that if we can really get to the bottom of the root cause analysis of the problem and start working with um, to, to rectify the social isolation or the mental health problem, it certainly makes resolving the rest of the the, the issues a little bit more easier. Um, uh, that links into is some of the recent evidence base which I've put on the screen to you, which is um, international studies. Uh, I think that the, the, the Booker study there on the left hand side is the, the national study, international study, and the Scotland Strickland study to the right is more national. But this is what the evidence base has found, which is a um, very robust method of, of saying, okay, so what do patients who are frequent callers, what do they call with? And so I won't go through the list there, but um, more often than not, what we do find is that the root cause analysis doesn't meet uh, the chief complaint of why patients phone us for help. And I think the reason by uh, the reason for that is because they they sometimes struggle to a process the problem that they have, but b to communicate exactly what it is they would like. And I think that we can um, demonstrate some sympathy with our fr uh, our colleagues at primary care at this point. Um, which can uh, link to some of the demands that are being placed on the emergency and the primary care setting. So if we look at the GP with the patient that goes in there, perhaps with, a, let's look at the sick person uh, call behavior attribute on the right hand side. At the moment, the GP to, to maintain all of his clinical or, or her clinical performance indicators must assess, um, take a full history from that patient and come up with a treatment plan in, in, in sub 10 minutes. Um, which we know that working comprehensively with these patients is very, very tricky and challenging to do. Um, frequent callers take an enormous amount of emotional intelligence to get to the root cause of the problem and can sometimes take um, a lot longer than hours. It can be days or, or weeks to actually build that trust to enable us to actually investigate to the bottom of what makes somebody a frequent caller to try to change their behavior. Um, that aside, we, we do know nationally that, that these calls from frequent callers do manifest usually in chest pain, abdominal pain or problems or, or breathing problems secondary to anxiety. And that is, again, indicated and reinforced there by, by the evidence base. Just to touch upon Mark's point um, about uh, there's a need for a kind of service to interact with these patients, which could decrease or even eliminate their need to call 909. Um, I would agree. I think that some of the um, fantastic work which has been proven to show a great improvement in the management of frequent callers nationally has provided that service, but has also provided a care coordination service. But again, I will uh, touch upon that in a future slide, but, but great thoughts and input there from Mark, so thank you very much. 
Um, Alan's just asked whether the campaign such as Choose Well reduces frequent callers. I think it does, and I think that um, the more public engagement and education that we can um, conduct with the entire patient cohort has to be beneficial um, to certainly the management of frequent callers, but our wider patient cohort as an, as an inter-ambulance service in itself. So, for example, we know uh, as a national ambulance services that over Christmas if we put um, uh, some resources out there to, to ask patients to, to choose well that it does have an effect. I think the problem that we have is to find a way of engaging the wider public to uh, maintain that message for a prolonged period of time and I think the only way we can do that is by some very clear and robust education into what we can and what we can't do um, but also um, to enable ourselves to educate patients to say okay so if we if we are here this is where we can refer you on to if, if, if we're not the ideal place first time. So uh, great question there by Alan, Alan Davis. Um, just on the patient education um, point, the, the uh, best method that we've ever had of, of um, or sorry, the best example of patient education that we've ever had is, has been smoking cessation, and that's taken us nearly up to, to 40 years and millions of pounds worth of investment. So uh, certainly this is an area which I'm quite passionate about that we need to, to certainly improve nationally and certainly as a, as a profession to, to get a little bit better at. Thank you very much for that question. Which brings me to the point of, uh, are we part of the problem at the moment? Um, a couple of slides previously I discussed that um, if we could standardize the way that we deal with frequent callers and uh, the way that we talk about them and categorize them, perhaps this could yield some benefits towards the national management of frequent callers. However, it could be argued that, that the categorization of patients in this way has actually generated part of the problem and, and uh, has exacerbated frequent caller behavior. As a healthcare economy, we are very good at delivering packages of care. If you uh, sustain major trauma, we have a, a protocol that we will deliver, certainly from within pre-hospital uh, world, we will take you to the most appropriate receiving location. They will um, deliver the very best uh, quality excuse me, of patient care. Um, and then they will refer you to secondary units for rehab and things like that. And that's because you have one very clear-cut condition um, with a, a very clear pathway and process going forward, which is, which is well-practiced and well-versed. In contrast, frequent callers by their nature are so complex that there is not one single process or pathway which will rectify or resolve the problem. And what we need to do as a healthcare economy is to is to welcome that variety and variation of patient and to be able to provide a very generalist response back which provides um, a more broader um, patient experience so that we don't necessarily we, we're not necessarily expert but we can certainly co uh, coordinate the care for that patient in, in a more appropriate manner and the only way we can do that is to again work collaboratively with each other I think the way that the healthcare economy at the moment is set up promotes silo practice and uh, and doesn't exactly promote a collaborative approach. And the reason for that is because we do get focused certainly as um, as wider healthcare providers on the doing rather than the process. And there's a very good reason for that. Obviously, we've got statistics and we've got patients that have very high expectations and quite rightly so. However, I think that if we pay more attention on the journey of our patient rather than the end product, we could certainly get uh, a lot more value out of the wider process. And I'm going to go into value production in some greater detail in, in, a, in a future slide. We need to ensure that the quality of care that we offer for our patient in, in the whole pathway um, is, is good, is excellent, in fact. And, and not just look at that little bit of, of the care process. And I think as pre-hospital care providers, some of the evidence base would suggest that we focus too heavily on our little part of the care, pa on the patient care pathway. If as an organization and as professionals, we focus too heavily on getting the patient to the right place and then nothing else, we will never be able to know whether that was the right thing or the wrong thing to do for that patient. It inhibits personal reflection and it doesn't allow the patient to enable to it doesn't enable the patient, sorry, to tell us how good or bad that experience is. If, however, we start to have adopt uh, sorry, a holistic approach towards the care pathway process, we actually get to see what happened at the start, which was good, what happened in the middle, which perhaps was good or bad, and then we get to evaluate at the end so that we can look at the whole care uh, pathway 
and see did we actually need that middle part or could we have gone straight to source or perhaps are we missing a trick in the middle which perhaps patients would find very valuable. Again I think what we've also found within the evidence base is that the patient experience is so important towards um, the quality of care that patient thinks that he or, or she should receive and we should very much focus on that as care providers as well as the, as well as the clinical aspect to ensure that we deliver the very best possible care for our patient. Um, the World Health Organization um, defines the uh, clinical quality um, as uh, the, the patient's standard of living after treatment has, has been given or certainly the care process has been, has been conceived. And I, I think that we need to adopt more of that as pre-hospital care providers to look at how is, this, how is our treatment going to impact the patient's quality of life as opposed to how is our treatment going to affect this individual piece of care for, for the patient at that time. Um, Tina's just posted a question, will there be any recognition for trust to provide the best care packages for these patients such as key performance indicators? Um, well, I, I, I would suggest so, yeah. So um, they say that imitation is the best form of, of flattery and what we're certainly doing within FreeCan is sharing the best practices nationally um, to enable us to um, deliver the best quality of care for our patients and I'm going to, going to chat a little bit more detail about how I'm planning to do that. Um, in terms of financial recognition or reward, the, what we've actually found is that um, the resources which are consumed by frequent callers can be so vast is that there are also some financial benefits to be received there. Um, that, that's not to say a bonus for example but it is to, to ensure that we do use the majority of the resources what we have as ambulance organizations much more efficiently when this problem um, or this challenge is addressed. But for, for me we need to focus on the quality of care uh, not the recognition. I, I very much think that that's going to be a, a byproduct and that's certainly the impression I get from you Tina when, when you've posted that, that question. Um, so thank you very much. <clears throat> so moving on to the national approach and, and how we work with frequent callers, what, what we've found at the moment is that there are a number of strategies adopted um, nationally um, which can be broadly categorized into regional approaches, local approaches or individual approaches. So regional approaches adopted by certain ambulance services aim to um, look at the problem on a county-wide basis for example and aim to implement case workers to um, identify instances of care where perhaps some services haven't been considered. Just to explain myself in a little bit better detail where, um, for example, if we know that somebody has COPD who presents regularly to us with difficulty in breathing and hasn't accessed the community respiratory matron, the regional approach will aim to identify that complete cohort of patient, patients within that county and then send the patient to the most appropriate receiving um, referral service in that area. That is fantastic in terms of the way that the organization manages frequent callers because you get very good value for money um, in terms of that one individual is impacting the care of a lot of patients within that county. However, what I would argue is that this approach um, is good for the patients that have um, one of the contributing factors such as the mismanagement of chronic comorbidity for example but isn't great, it, it doesn't provide the necessary level of complexity um, for the more complex or entrenched or prolific frequent caller. What we've also found is a local approach as well where the um, a certain named in, uh, individual or lead professional within the ambulance service perhaps at a station level will adopt a cohort of frequent callers which they will try to case manage but also try to act as that care coordinator. So it's in between the individual and the regional approach. What we've found here is that these patients tend to work very well with that middle cohort of patient, the escalating or the de-escalating patient because they provide just the right level of complexity but also can have um, a, a wider impact on a greater number of patients. What we've also found some fantastic pockets of best practices in, uh, are, are surrounding individuals and these are individual clinicians or, me or members of ambulance organizations which work with a very small cohort of the most prolific or entrenched of service users and will take them through a process which enables them to be supported within the pre-hospital uh, and primary care environment but also allows them to um, 
also enables them to build trust within the wider health and social care economy. So um, what we found here is, uh, I know there's a certain pilot within the north of, of the UK where a um, advanced practitioner with a cohort of 50 patients um, and that individual then provided care plans for each of those 50 patients and literally provided 12 hour cover um, available on the end of the telephone if the patient were to reach crisis or not. And because that, patient, uh, because that individual built up such rapport with their patients, um, they managed to overcome the communication difficulties and get to the root cause analysis of that crisis point in, in a lot more detail and very quickly. Now, each of those different approaches have um, have good parts and bad parts. As I said, the regional approach provides good value for money. The local approach um, allows you to uh, identify a specific cohort of uh, a frequent caller and really deal with those in, in some great detail. And the individual approach uh, enables you to, to deal with the prolific or the entrenched frequent caller. However, what we've not found is, is that red box in the middle of the Venn diagram is anywhere or any ambulance organization which adopts every single approach. And the reason for that is because of the resources required in which to to do that. So the regional approach that I've seen work in other ambulance services has got um, uh, a band seven lead and then a band six to um, take ownership of that individual region. Um, the local approach takes um, doesn't really matter about banding; it's the communication expertise of that of that of that individual. Um, but that's on a so, uh, on a station level, um, and and that can be quite costly if you've obviously got a lot of stations within a certain a certain area. An individual basis, you've only got a, a little, uh, a small patient cohort. So there's a huge risk there if you don't change the behaviour of that patient cohort within a certain period of time. You don't, you don't exactly get the cost to benefit ratio that that, that finance directors or certainly operational directors of any organisation would, would would like. So what what there is a drive to do now is to collect the evidence about which uh, approach works best. And, and in fact to try to apply every single one of these approaches in everything that we do. And the part that really excites and empowers me is that this isn't out of the, um, this isn't impossible for any ambulance organization, certainly but that we have with, within, um, within England, Scotland, Wales uh, or Northern Ireland. Um, apologies, I'm, I'm not quite sure about the approach on the Republic of Ireland as yet. That's something that I'm trying to engage with at the moment. But the really exciting part for me is, is that we already have the infrastructure in place in which to, to be able to apply these different approaches with as well. And, and we're seeing now some movements in that in the, these approaches are, are really looking at being adopted. Just be mindful on time. Um, what I've also done is to apply some value production methodology, which is has been actually pulled from engineering, um, the engineering sector, to look at exactly how are we managing the current processes that we have within these different approaches, um, and how can we get the most value out of them. So more often than not, within within any industry, we can produce value in one of three ways. And if anybody knows of a fourth way to pr to produce value, you're going to be a very rich person, um, because certainly this is what the evidence base is crying out for. But there's a chain method of produ producing value, and this is we can usually characterise this by a car production line, um, whereas you start off with your chassis, you then put the the shell on top, you then put your seats in, and then goes on down the production line, you put your wheels on. And what we found is that processes are largely one way and they rely on predictability and protocol. And the best way that we can work with chains is to make them as short as possible and as easy to access and to get through, to get to the very end of it as soon as possible. Um, in contrast, the value shop method of value production um, is very much aimed at problem solving. And the best example I can give you of a value shop model of value production is taking your car into the mechanics. It, the, the mechanic is, is, is producing lots of value when he finds the fault on your vehicle uh, as soon as possible, he gets the correct part, he puts that car, uh, that part into your car, he fixes your car straight away, he gets it out of his garage um, so that he can then see his next customer. Um, in contrast, what the final uh, method of producing value is the value network, and it's here where companies like telecommunications, O2, Vodafone, this is where they actually make, make their money. And it's because what they do is nothing other than put um, person A in touch with person B. Um, they make the networks and the network itself produces the value. Um, it's providing that infrastructure to get people to chat to each other. Now the really exciting part for me is 
frequent callers actually um, contain all and every single one of these methods of value production. However, perhaps the reason why we don't manage frequent callers as well as we could do at the moment is because um, we don't really get to the bottom of, of how we can make these things the best that they can possibly be. And so I took um, a few ambulance service processes of working with frequent callers and applied this methodology as well as the lean eight type type of waste methodology, which basically suggests if any of these eight characteristics of, of waste are present, that you aren't producing value. And this is one of the methods which an ambulance service uh, manages frequent callers. At the very top, you can see the information gathering phase where the ambulance service is trying to find out as much information on that, po on that patient as possible. And quickly, we move down into a network um, methodology of value production where we're trying to look at the different areas, uh, the different services such as mental health trusts or the police, um, or for example, different services we can refer to um, to try to solve that problem. The box to the bottom left of the page, this is where we get to our value shop and this is where we get everybody to sit around the table um, and we, we, we try to find the root cause analysis of the problem and we try to put the intervention in place. <coughs> Excuse me. And so what we, will, what we need to do as ambulance service providers is to make sure that all of our chains, which you can see such as the, at the very top, we need to make them as short and as streamlined as possible. What we need to make sure is that our network on the bottom right hand side of the page is comprehensive enough so that any patient that calls with any problem can be put in touch with the necessary service they need as soon as possible and of the first time of asking. What we also need to do when we're taking the value shop method, bottom left hand side of the page into consideration, is to get the right people sitting around the table and to find out the right solution the first time so that we don't have to keep meeting um, and the patient gets out of that crisis as soon as possible. And that's indicated very much in this diagram here, which is the crisis curve. What we tend to do as ambulance organisations at the moment is identify and try intervention number one, two and three far too late at the crisis curve, uh, up the crisis curve, it's too close to the peak. And that means it takes a lot more effort, resource and skill to be able to get that patient out of crisis again. We need to get them into the back into the emerging stage or the potential stage. Now this is where the dots tr uh, seem to line up because if we can spot the patterns and, and the trends of patient that enter crisis um, at a very early stage, it will take less resource to get them out of that of that pattern and to get them out of that crisis. So if we can proactively identify that um, Mrs. Miggins, uh, uh, who has COPD, has called us perhaps five times within that month because of difficulty in breathing, she's not yet got some antibiotics, we can nip that in the bud by referring back to primary care, getting a crisis pack sorted which has perhaps steroids and antibiotics already in there that the patient can take and the patient won't go any further into a crisis uh, and, and will receive the best quality of patient care. So in summary, what we need to do is to shift all of our activity across to the left, we need to be more proactive in how we manage frequent callers and not reactive, which is, which is kind of strange for us as pre-hospital care providers and as organisations um, that have really founded what we do best on a very reactive um, approach towards the management of patients. We, we are very reactive by our very nature, um, but certainly within regard to frequent callers, we need to change that. And I've summarised that in the slide, which is the common issues which face ambulance services nationally. Um, there is a need for standardisation so that we are all talking about the same patient cohort, um, but then also on a local level that if somebody, if a clinician does identify a frequent caller, um, then they know how that can be dealt with. We also need to improve the accountability um, which is available certainly within local structures, within regional structures and within organisational structures um, to enable us to um, escalate patients that perhaps need greater levels of care. A good example here is um, there was a patient certainly which presented in an ambulance service in the north of the country um, that was calling uh, the ambulance service more than 30 times per day. Um, 
in summary, uh, a potential solution was getting that patient a living carer. However, because he didn't fulfil the requirements of health or social care for a living carer, um, it was very tricky to get one. What we did, or certainly what um, some of the colleagues in the north did, was to work with commissioners to um, complete some out of the box commissioning, which perhaps went through a bit of a less protocol and process driven uh, phase to get the money there to have the living carer for that patient. And straight away, that had a great impact on that patient's call uh, volume. So we need to get those routes of escalation there. We need to work collaboratively with um, commissioners and with healthcare providers, certainly within our regions, to look at alternative ways and methods which are necessarily outside the box of, of managing these patients. I also think what we need to do is to quantify what we do a lot better. Um, and we need to celebrate our quick wins. Certainly this is something that we don't do very well uh, uh, as ambulance services nationally. We've got some great data relating to the amount of calls that we have um, uh, and what happened on AMPDS with that patient. However, we don't quantify the outcome of that job very well. We don't quantify the patient's experience very well or whether the, the decision that we made was the right one. And that's very tricky when we're trying to convey the value in managing this patient cohort to commissioners um, or to the Department of Health or, or, or anybody else. Because if we can't quantify and provide evidence behind why this topic is so important and why we feel that we're doing a good job of it, um, that's going to be very difficult to get at the top of anybody else's agenda. And so what I feel that we need to do is to reduce the confusion, reduce the ambiguity, and to make things much more efficient um, by completing um, all of the uh, attributes that we have there. We need to enhance the support mechanisms that we've got to our staff and to organizations. Uh, we need to promote those routes of escalation, and we need to share best practice, both nationally and locally, um, into how we manage frequent callers. And we need to improve the evidence that we have, certainly as a professional cohort and as ambulance organizations, um, to improve the clinical quality that we're offering to our patients. I also think we need to pay very keen attention to the value that we're offering to our patients, both from a clinical point of view, from a quality point of view, and from a finance and a resource point of view, because this is the only way that we can in, uh, instigate and promote change. So how are we going to do that? Well, what we've found works very well is by implementing care plans for these patients and by sharing them with the wider health and social care economy. Um, they need to be very clear, they need to be comprehensive, uh, and they need to be able to be applied certainly for ourselves within the emergency pre-hospital sphere and within uh, our colleagues within primary or, or secondary care sphere as well. Uh, our colleagues within the Northwest um, have very kindly given me permission to show their community care plan and this has done a very good job of doing that. Um, this care plan can be made by GPs on their EMIS system um, and provides all of the details that the paramedic or the community nurse or matron may need um, when they enter that patient's property um, as well as a, a directory of professional networks or familial or social networks that may, that may benefit the care uh, for that patient. Where this has value for the frequent user is the specific or the niche services which that patient could be referred to are captured within this document. And the methods of which we should use to refer these patients, such as whether it be a secure email, a phone call, or a fax, and the previous uh, medical history which supports that referral can also be captured by this document. But to implement the number of care plans that we would like um, is, is, is a huge change. Uh, and we certainly need to inspire our colleagues within primary, secondary, and tertiary care um, to work with us in doing this. And that's not going to be easy. Um, what we need to do, uh, what we've got here is, is, is the Class Johnson full room apartment model of change and, on, on the, the top left box there. And at the moment, I think we have certainly a lot of healthcare professionals in the contentment or the denial phase, or certainly the confusion phase. Um, I think what we need to do is to get them to the renewal phase. We need to empower them to say, okay, let's try something that little bit different um, to support our patients, to support certainly the quality of care that we're offering to our patients but to also to work better as organizations, which is going to improve uh, our own quality of life as, as clinicians within the NHS. Um, I also think what we need to do uh, to get us to that renewal phase is to educate, to empower, to infuse, uh, and to celebrate the quick wins that we've got within our organizations. We need to show when we are doing things well. 
Um, we need to reward ourselves for doing that, giving ourselves a good pat on the back, but we also need to encourage ourselves to continue to do more. Um, and the way I think that we can do that is to inspire the competition, certainly between ambulance services nationally and certainly within our own organisations to say, okay, so if area A is doing better than area B, then area B are going to make sure they're not going to get beat on the next, the next phase of asking. So what I thought I'd do now is to present some case studies of patients uh, across the country um, that, that have been frequent callers that, that have certainly had some um, benefit from the collaborative approach which we've discussed uh, this evening. So the first patient was a 55-year-old gentleman who was of no fixed abode, who usually called 909 for central chest pain or mobility problems. Um, the big issue with this patient is that he hadn't received a um, health assessment within primary care because he wasn't registered with his GP, which then led on to different um, secondary and tertiary problems. Um, that had also led to a dependency on alcohol, which then deteriorated the mental health of the patient. Um, you can see in the second point there how many resources this patient took up. But what the, the frequent caller team of this ambulance service managed to do is to collaborate with certainly the, the GP practice to get him reg uh, registered uh, and also to work with what was available within social services, which was the street outreach team, to be able to identify that patient, to pin him down, um, to provide an, uh, an immediate health uh, assessment, um, but to also then refer that patient on to the alcohol dependency services and to the um, services which could provide counselling for that patient um, and onward treatment. What we actually found very recently is that that patient's call behaviour dropped substantially following this input, um, which was phenomenal to see. Um, that patient got um, offered some sheltered accommodation, which also provided uh, the services to um, reduce his alcohol dependency and his general uh, health and his well-being has improved following this input. Now, the really reassuring part for me here is that all of this was instigated by the frequent caller team of this ambulance service, um, who have managed to cross the boundaries between primary, secondary, tertiary care and emergency care. So this, is a, this was a fantastic case study for me. The second patient is, is slightly different. Uh, this lady was 76 years old, uh, an entrenched frequent caller who was very difficult to, um, to try to engage with. Um, she attended multiple emergency departments uh, along with her GP. Um, she was a, a generally well-kept woman um, who um, presented quite normally um, during periods of non-crisis, but because of an anxiety disorder, um, had exacerbation of breathing problems. Um, which made the, the immediate management of that patient very challenging. What the frequent caller team of, of this lady did was to coordinate a very comprehensive care plan um, and very cleverly use some cognitive behavioural therapy to enable to plot where at the crisis, uh, point of crisis that, that patient was. Um, and that enabled the patient to be um, to, to generate a patient-centred care plan. So she very much took the responsibility of care on herself. Um, that was absolutely fantastic because she felt that um, she was then managing her own situation, which reduced the amount of times that that lady went into crisis. Um, in addition to that, what the care plan also captured was a 12 lead ECG, which was slightly uh, deranged, uh, which was the, the, the patient's usual presenting state, which was then used to provide a very standardized approach towards the management of that patient, which was also captured in the care plan. Um, the patient was supported to stay at home without conveyance to the emergency department and was, was um, repeatedly referred to the accepting mental health uh, provider of the area who had found a very good method of getting that patient out of crisis. This was a diagram of the cognitive behavioural therapy which was implemented on, on that patient which, which was so successful um, and this was the uh, impact of, of, of this intervention to that patient. Again, we saw a very dramatic decrease in the amount of incidents um, relatively recently for this patient. Finally, we had uh, patient three. This was, a, again, a patient who was of no fixed abode, um, who, again, was presented with mental health problems and self-neglect. Um, this patient was a very Keen, uh, was, was, was keen to disengage with health and social care providers um, due to a lack of previous understanding and I think there was an attempt from um, previous uh, providers to try to coordinate the care which had failed. 
um, so the patient had lost a little bit of faith. Um, the interesting thing with this patient was that um, English was not uh, his first language and so we managed to get to the root cause of the problem by actually um, using the patient's native tongue to enable us to actually make him feel more relaxed to get to the root cause of that problem. Um, what we then did was to capture that in a care plan so that when at all possible um, we shared that uh, so that all of the other health and uh, care providers could also uh, demonstrate that form of communication. Um, and again, we managed to tie up all of the services which were available in that community for that patient um, and we repeatedly used the same care pathway to de-escalate this patient's crisis. And again, it's really reassuring to see that that patient's core behavior decreased uh, pretty much immediately. So what we find is that when we do find the right solution, it is incredibly powerful. Um, and on that note, I would like to thank you all very much for your time and invite any further questions um, if anybody would like to offer. Excellent. Great presentation there, David. Um, if anybody has any questions, you're more than welcome to pop them into the um, question box now and I will read them out for David to answer. Uh, actually, we have just got one come through. Uh, I like the plans, but how do you share the information with social services and who can modify the care plans if required to reduce the impact on the ambulance service? So, I mean, this is, a, this is a fantastic question from Elizabeth, and this is one of the challenges that I think we're facing nationally as ambulance services. There isn't a single platform to host or to share care plans, but what we have found is where there are local solutions, um, we are reaping the benefit of this, certainly as a healthcare economy. Um, Within the Northwest, for example, they have a system called the Electronic Referral Information Sharing Service, which is hosted by the ambulance service, which allows any health or social care provider to um, contribute towards a care plan for the patient um, and to also to add and to edit um, and to enhance the collaborative practice with the ambulance service, which, which then builds into um, the quality of care which we as an ambulance service offer to that patient. However, um, we have also found that we don't have platforms such as that nationally. I'm not sure if you've all seen um, today that the uh, Resource Council are currently trialing um, a type of, of care plan platform. Um, they're actually after as much feedback from paramedics as possible, so I'd really urge you all to please go and have a look and provide your feedback on that type of care plan. But it's hoped that if we can get a standardized care plan, is that following that we will receive a standardized platform in which we can share and edit um, care plans across the health and social care setting. I think that there was an appetite uh, at one point for the NHS spine to provide this information. However, it, it doesn't seem to have manifested in a way that enables the health and social care providers nationally in which to do that. So we are looking at plan B at the moment. Um, there are some pockets, again, uh, the theme of frequent callers, there are some pockets of fantastic practice in, in certain areas. Um, certainly within London and, and end of life care, there is Coordinate My Care, which is, which is seeming to, to also um, span these boundaries. Um, but these are few and far between. So I think we have a key role as um, pre-hospital clinicians, first and foremost, to, to participate in... Um, uh, review studies such as what, what the Resource Council are doing at the moment with care plans, but then to advocate the importance of platforms which enable us to, to share this data freely um, and to work that much better with each other. So thank you very much for that question, Elizabeth. Okay, and the last question from Stacey. Um, Stacey has asked, um, as an individual paramedic on scene, how would you explain to a frequent service user to stop calling the services? I think it's really important. So first and foremost, patient-centered care should be absolutely pivotal to everything that we do. And I, I, I think in very few occasions is it beneficial to tell a patient to stop calling us completely. I think what we need to do um, certainly is to get to the root cause of the problem. And, and I'm not suggesting that this is the, the role of the clinician at the, at the certain time, but certainly what we need to do is to get to the root cause of the problem and try to understand why that patient is, is, is calling us so many times. Um, certainly I, w I wouldn't like me bursting through the door at, at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, and, and I struggle to think that anybody else would want that as well. What we, what we have found is that these patients do struggle to communicate what it is exactly they want and so studies within the Northwest for example have found that um, 
of rehousing is is one of the best, or, or certainly working collectively with housing officers is one of the best solutions towards frequent callers, and yet has absolutely nothing to do with the the reason why they're calling 999 for. Perhaps these patients are just feeling so confused and don't know how to get out of their crisis point that there's nobody else to call. That's not to say that that we should. Um, that we shouldn't become involved in, in that process, but I think what we need to do is to flag that up with the wider health and social care economy and then come up with a collective solution which is going to be beneficial to that patient. So thanks very much for that, Stacey. That's a good answer, David, good answer. Uh, if anybody else has any more questions, I'm aware that uh, time is getting on. Uh, David has popped his email address up on the screen and so you can capture that. Uh, if you don't capture it enough, uh, I will very shortly be sending you a copy of this presentation and so you should uh, you should get it by email. I'm just going to bob back over to my screen and I'm just going to summarise uh, what's gone on tonight. And so what I will do to you guys and girls who have attended is I will send you all a recording of this presentation within 24 hours. Uh, and you'll also get a, a certificate of attendance which will drop automatically into your portfolio or indeed come to you by email. Um, just before I go on, that is where your platform will drop. So when you get your certificate or your recording, it will drop into your platform on CPDME. And all that we ask you to do is you go in there and you edit how the information you've learned tonight from David might influence the change of practice. I'll just very quickly point out a couple more free webinars that's available to you. Tomorrow night, we have got um, How to Manage Air in the Chest uh, by Andy Thomas, which you can register for now on the website. And we've also got another fantastic presentation in March on Fitness to Practice by a colleague called um, Oliver Mundy, who's going to talk about that. Uh, so all that's left for me to do is say thank you very much to David Fletcher, who's come to join us tonight. Thank you very much, everybody. It's, uh, I've had a great time. And uh, please do get in touch if you have any further questions or you'd like to contribute in any way. Thank you very much. And all that's left for me to say is thanks very much. Keep up the good work, folks. And I hope to see you soon at another webinar. Thank you and good night.